Picture two cartoons. First cartoon, Noah and his wife are on the deck of the ark, surrounded by animals. She leans over to him and says, after this, I'm going to need a lot of aromatherapy. <laughs> Second cartoon, two unicorns are, unicorns are lying in bed. Mr. Unicorn is reading the newspaper. He announces, big storms are brewing. Mrs. Unicorn turns to him and says, then I'm glad we didn't go on that cruise th thing with your crazy friend, Noah. <laughs> Shell Sil Silverstein offered another explanation as to why there are no unicorns. Putting his words to music, the Irish Rovers sold eight million copies of the unicorn song. Then Noah looked out through the driving rain. The unicorns were hiding, playing silly games, kicking and splashing while the rain was pouring. But on the ark, there were green alligators and long-necked geese, some humpyback camels, and some chimpanzees. Noah had to close the doors, and the water sort of floated the unicorns away. And that's why you never see a unicorn to this very day. We taught our children the story of Noah and the ark. They played with a little Fisher-Price Noah's set. They would bring the toy animals onto the ark and you could hear them say things like, got to hurry up and get them out of the water so they don't drown. It was fun. We also taught our kids about dinosaurs. We took them to natural history museums, they saw fossils and skeletons and full replicas of dinosaurs. So it would be natural for them or any church kid to ask this question, were there dinosaurs on the ark? In that question, we see the clash of two worldviews. First, there is a primordial biblical history and the story from Genesis 6 through 9 of the flood. Then there is what we learn from science about dinosaurs roaming the earth and the earth being 4.5 billion years old. Some Christians who take the story of Noah literally try to make these two worldviews coincide. They ignore the results of science or force them into the biblical framework. For example, there are those who argue that the earth is only 6,000 years old and that four or 5,000 years ago, there was a flood that covered the entire earth. Christians who do not take the Noah story literally may answer the children's question as Adam Hamilton does. Dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. Homo sapiens did not come on the scene until around 200,000 years ago. No, there were no dinosaurs on the ark. Adults have also been asking questions about the story of Noah's Ark for a long time. In 1872, many adults started asking whether the story of Noah was a historical account or even an original story. Why? Because that was the year George Smith translated the ancient flood story from Akkadian. I took one se semester of Akkadian. Probably I should reword that. Acadian took one semester of me. The story was found in the Epic of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia. It contained a story of the flood, apparently much older than the story in the Bible. However, there were several similarities and details. So it was obvious to most people that the biblical story was dependent on the Mesopotamian story. However, it was not that the biblical story was copied from the Mesopotamian story. More probably, there were flood stories floating around. Just wanted to see if you're listening. <laughs> it was part of the culture, just like people assuming that God or the gods were pleased with animal sacrifices was part of their culture. The flood story of Noah is similar to other ancient flood stories from the ancient Near East. For example, when Noah finally got off the boat, he built an altar and offered animal sacrifices to worship God. God was so pleased when he smelled the delicious aroma that he made a covenant never to destroy the world again by flood. 
In one of the earlier Mesopotamian stories, it says that when the flood ended, the hero got off the boat and built an altar and offered animal sacrifices. It reads, the gods gathered like flies. Why? They were starved by being so long without sacrifices. So even though there are similarities, there are significant differences between the biblical story and the older stories. First, the reason for the flood. In one of the Mesopotamian stories, the gods are irritated because humans are making so much noise. They want to get rid of their noisy neighbors, so the gods are going to wipe them out. On the other hand, in the Bible, God is offended because people have become so violent to each other. It was a moral issue. Second, there's only one God in the Noah story. In the other stories, one God instigates, instigates wiping out humanity, but then another God whispers the plan to the hero, and he builds a boat to escape the flood. Is there anything wrong with biblical writers appropriating common stories to tell about their God, Yahweh? It's sort of like Charles Wesley appropriating pub tunes for some of the hymns that he wrote and we still sing. Yes, the story of the flood is a terrible story. When we tell it to our kids or grandkids, we tend to leave out all the floaters in the water. I recently read a true story about a couple who enrolled their daughter in a private Christian school. They were so excited that this school was going to teach their daughter positive values. One day their little girl came home and they asked the question that we parents often ask, what did you learn in school today? The little girl told them the story of Noah and the ark and how God destroyed everyone except for Noah and his family. The parents became very angry. They could not believe that their little girl had been exposed to such an awful story. So they were so outraged they withdrew her from the school and they said, our God wouldn't do that. There's a great deal to be offended about in this ancient story. I've always wanted Noah to negotiate with God the way Abraham does later. God, you wouldn't destroy the cities if you found 50 righteous people, would you? Abraham haggles with God. In the end, God agrees not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there are just 10 righteous people. We would want Noah to lobby on behalf of his neighbors or his town, but Noah is silent. By the way, I think that's why Noah is proclaimed righteous. Noah obeys God without ever speaking. He never opens his mouth until after the flood when he has a hangover and he's angry with his son. If you never talk, it's easy, or easier anyway, not to sin. Yes, I realize I'm the one up here doing all the talking. So, is there anything positive we can take from this story, given all the historical, scientific, moral, and ethical questions it raises? Paul wrote, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we could have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. How does the story of Noah and the flood give us hope and encouragement? It's God's covenant with humanity symbolized by the rainbow. In Genesis 5, we read, The Lord saw that humanity had become thoroughly evil on the earth and that every idea their minds thought up was always completely evil. Then comes one of the saddest lines in the Bible. The Lord regretted making human beings on the earth, and he was heartbroken. God's being heartbroken showed how much he cared for humans and the rest of creation. God grieved over the violence of humanity. So the Lord said, I will wipe off of the land the human race that I've created, from human beings to livestock to the crawling things to the birds in the skies, because I regret I ever made them. Is God still grieving? News, news items suggest that the Lord is still sad. In the name of God, a suicide bomber blew himself up in a mosque in Pakistan. He killed dozens of worshipers. A video was released of the fatal beating of Tyre Nichols 
in, by Memphis police. A lone gunman killed 11, wounded nine at a ballroom dance studio in Monterey Park, California. Then there is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The story of Noah teaches us that in spite of our tendency toward violence, God still cares about us. God does not completely give up on us. David Leininger tells about a discussion of Noah sometime back on a public television series. It was called Genesis, A Living Conversation. It was hosted by Bill Moyers. One of the participants in that PBS conversation with Bill Moyers was a newspaper editor. Bill asked him what would be the headline for, the, for an article that would tell the story of Noah. He responded, God destroys world. Quickly, another panelist, Samuel Proctor, a retired pastor, jumped in with an alternative headline, God gives humanity second chance. Reverend Proctor nailed it. As horrible as this story is to imagine, God did not give up completely on humanity. God never does. That is what the rainbow symbolizes. Our tendency is to go the wrong way, but God will keep starting over, making new beginnings with us. God sent his only son to bring good news of another new beginning a new beginning of salvation for all and eternal life through Jesus Christ. Over and over, in the midst of our sinfulness, in the midst of our willfulness, in the midst of our wandering and our inhumanity to each other, God begins again and again with us. The late Phil Silvers told of a time when he allowed his daughter a second chance. Some of you may remember Phil as television's beloved Sergeant Bilko. It was before my time, but I've read about it. <laughs> he said that once his small daughter woke him up while he was taking a much needed nap, he scolded her. Didn't you promise to be a good girl and not make any noise? She responded, yes, daddy. And he said, and didn't I promise you a spanking if you weren't a good girl? Yes, daddy. Then she added, but since I didn't keep my promise, you don't have to keep yours. <laughs> God offers us mercy when we don't deserve it. Isn't that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? God offers us a covenant of grace. A generation ago, Judy Garland captured our imagination as she dreamed of a place somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. There's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. A better world to which we might escape when trials and troubles threaten to overwhelm. Somewhere over the rainbow, blue birds fly. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why, oh, why can't I? We know the feeling. The reality is that as, as appealing as that magical ride into the blue might be, we can be comforted knowing that we live under the rainbow. God's promise of grace hovers over us as a divine punctuation mark at the end of every storm. Yes, and we are flooded time and time again. The pain comes in waves, but we are under God's rainbow. The grief threatens to overwhelm us, but we are under God's rainbow. The loneliness is about to drown us, but we are under God's rainbow. The stress is stifling, but we are under God's rainbow. The abuse has worn us out, but we are under God's rainbow. God's message of grace to Noah is the ark in which we can take refuge. No matter what, remember that we are under God's rainbow, the rainbow of God's love and grace, and that gives us hope. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this ancient story of Noah and the promise of the rainbow. It reminds us of how often we fail you, but also how you offer us second chances, third chances, and more. As we live into these cascading mercies, may we grow in our love for you, for each other, and for all your creatures. 
Amen.